Welcome to the lecture about stem cell biology. This lecture is intended to be a brief overview about stem cells and some of the ways that they are utilized in the clinic. A cell is a complex organ. There are many living things that are composed of one or more cells, and there are two types of cells, a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell. There are many organelles that make up a cell, including a nucleus, which serves as the brains of the cell. A stem cell, by definition, is a self-renewing cell that can divide symmetrically to give rise to two daughter cells whose developmental potential is identical to the parent cell, or asymmetrically to generate daughter cells with different developmental potentials. Stem cells are found in all multicellular organisms, and they are the raw material from which all bodies mature and differentiated cells are made. They are characterized by the cell's ability to renew itself through mitotic cell division and differentiate into specialized cells. There are really two definitions that classify something as a stem cell. The ability to make copies of itself as well as the ability to differentiate into something else. When you think about any breakthrough that has come into the clinic, it takes more than 20 years to bring these through to the clinic. For example, recombinant proteins and monoclonal antibodies were originally developed in the 50s and didn't make it to the market until 20 plus years later. When you think about stem cell therapies, these began to be developed in the 70s and 80s, and so we are just getting to the point where we have many cell therapies that are developing and some on the market. This is the same for gene therapy, which is slightly behind that of cell therapy. Also, when you think about embryonic stem cells, these came about 10 years after the original cell therapy, so it will be many years until we begin to see embryonic stem cells and even the newest developed induced pluripotent stem cells on the market. Here is a brief history of some of the different types of stem cells that have been developed, as well as some of the different terms that have been coined. In 1908, the original term stem cell was coined. Then, in the 60s, we began doing bone marrow transplantations, which we often forget is actually a stem cell transplantation. In this case, we are trying to replenish the blood supply for cancer patients by predominantly using hematopoietic stem cells. However, there are quite a few mesenchymal cells that are also part of that population, and we will discuss the meaning of the different types of cells in this lecture series. The embryonic stem cell term wasn't coined until the 80s, when mouse embryonic stem cells were derived. Then, in the 90s, we began to discover that many cells existed within the body, leading to the discovery of human embryonic stem cells so that in 2001, we were able to first clone Dolly the sheep. After that, we began to more rapidly develop stem cells from a variety of different sources, and for the first time in 2007, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the work done in embryonic stem cells. Then, induced pluripotent stem cells came about, which are those that behave similar to an embryonic stem cell, but it was discovered that they could be made more pluripotent-like, and these were originating as adult stem cells. Then, in 2009, we had the first FDA approval of an embryonic stem cell trial, and in 2012, a stem cell scientist won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of induced pluripotent cells. There are two main properties that make up stem cells. The first is the ability of the cells to make copies of themselves. 
This is called self-renewal. They can go through numerous cell division cycles while maintaining an undifferentiated state. They also exhibit potency, the ability to develop into specialized cell types and tissues. There are various ways that the cells can make a copy. The first one is asymmetric, replicating and differentiation division. In this type, the stem cell divides, giving rise to two daughter cells. One will remain identical to itself and one responds to changes in environment, resulting in differentiation. Therefore, there are both maintenance of the stem cell population and differentiation. The second one is symmetric differentiating division, in which there is a depletion of the stem cell population without any cell renewal. The third kind of division is the symmetric replicating division, in which the stem cell population expands without or limited differentiation. Then, finally, we have the asymmetric division in which there is an amplification of the cell numbers and also differentiation via progenitor cells. The role of the progenitor cell is to increase cell numbers by division, and the activity of the progenitor cells varies within the different tissues. Potency defines what the cell is able to become, so it specifies the differentiation potential of those cells. There are five stem cell potencies. The first one is the totipotent stem cell, which only occurs in an embryo that is one to three days old and can differentiate into embryonic and extra embryonic cell types. Totipotent stem cells can develop into a complete organism and they are produced from the fusion of both the egg and the sperm. A pluripotent stem cell is what we often refer to as an embryonic stem cell. This type of stem cell occurs when it is a blastocyst at 5 to 14 days old. These are descendants of the totipotent stem cells and they can form any cell type that is derived from the three germ layers. You then have multipotential stem cells. These are adult stem cells that can be obtained, for example, from fetal tissue, cord blood, bone marrow, or adipose tissue. These cells are already somewhat differentiated, but have the ability to form a number of different tissues, Therefore, they are referred to as multipotential. You also have oligopotential stem cells. These can differentiate only into a few types of cells. Examples include lymphoid and myeloid cells. They can only form a subset of different types of tissues or cells. Unipotential stem cells. These can only produce one type of cell. In this case, muscle is a good example where the muscle stem cells have the ability to only produce muscle, but they still have that property of self-renewal. And so by that definition, they can be considered a stem cell. Stem cells can be used to help develop science and also lay a foundation for regenerative medicine. Stem cells have the potential to replace cell tissue that has been damaged or destroyed by severe illness. They can replicate themselves repeatedly over time, and understanding how stem cells develop into healthy and disease cells will assist the search for treatment of various illnesses. There are three main types of stem cells, the embryonic, the adult, and the induced pluripotent. First off, the embryonic. These are cultures that can be derived from the blastocyst, which is four to five days after the union of the sperm and the egg, but before the embryo implants into the uterus. Adult stem cells can be collected from an adult. 
These can also be collected from tissues such as the cord blood or the placenta, and these have the ability to divide and make copies of itself, as well as create differentiated types of cells or tissue. Adult cells have been successfully used to treat leukemia through bone marrow transplants in humans since the 60s and more recently have been used in regenerative medicine to successfully treat degenerative diseases involving almost every organ system. We are currently developing a variety of different therapies utilizing adult stem cells. Some of the strengths associated with adult stem cells is that there is no controversy associated with it. There's no ethical concerns because this is not derived from an unborn embryo. Another thing that is unique about the adult stem cells, in particular with the mesenchymal cells that can be obtained from these tissues, is that they are immunosuppressant in nature, meaning that not only will they not elicit an immune response if they are given to non-matched donors, but they will actually suppress the immune system, so you can give these in an allergenic manner, meaning to somebody else, or in a xenograph approach, meaning from a different species. There are also many different sources of adult stem cells. Some may say the limitations associated with adult stem cells is that their differentiation capacity is not as great as those from an embryo or the embryonic type stem cells, and they may have limited self-renewal. In other words, they can only make copies for a certain number of passages or lifespan, whereas an embryonic stem cell has the ability to grow for much longer periods of time. Some examples of adult-type stem cells include fetal stem cells or umbilical cord blood, amniotic stem cells which can be taken from the amniotic fluid, hematopoietic or mesenchymal-type cells. These can be obtained from bone marrow or from adipose tissue and even from things like teeth. The third type of stem cell are the induced pluripotent cells. These are cells that have been reprogrammed to exhibit pluripotential capabilities and similar to embryonic stem cells. They behave almost identically to embryonic stem cells, but they've been derived from adult tissue and then genetically reprogrammed so that they behave in a pluripotential way. The strengths can be that these can have a patient DNA match so they can be obtained from the same patient. They're very similar to embryonic stem cells in that they have the same differentiation capacity. Some of the limitations may include genetic predispositions or the viral gene delivery mechanism used to induce the pluripotent stem cell. Stem cells can be used autologously, meaning that the patient's own stem cells are extracted and then delivered back to the same patient. You can utilize stem cells very easily in a point-of-care type setting. Or allergenically, meaning that the cells injected into the patient are not their own cells but donor cells from relatives or completely unrelated. Important to note is that you can really only use the mesenchymal type cells in an allergenic way if you don't have a matched donor. The reason that you can do this is the mesenchymal cells will actually suppress the immune system and they will not elicit an immune response in non-matched donors. A xenograft approach means from a different species, so an example would be sheep cells into a human. We don't typically do this for other species into humans. However, there are several studies going on where you can take animals and put human cells into the animals. Actually, an investigational new animal drug has been approved where human cells are injected into dogs. You can also utilize stem cells to understand some of the different things that are going on inside the body. And you can use these cells to help to generate healthy and functioning specialized cells which can replace diseased or dysfunctional cells. This is similar to an organ transplantation, but in this case, 
you're only using the cells which can help to make the body begin to function in a more effective way. In basically any degenerative disease where there is diseased or dysfunctional tissue, the cells could be stimulated to develop into specialized cells that represent renewable sources of cells and tissue for transplantation. These are some examples of different diseases or degenerative conditions in which these cells could be useful. However, this is hardly an exhaustive list, and I think that there are many implications for use that we will discover in the years to come. Stem cells have also been utilized in drug development. This can speed up the drug development process because the drugs can be tested on just the human cell lines to determine whether or not it would be useful to proceed to further testing. Possible uses of stem cell technology are to replace tissue and organs, to repair defective cell types, to deliver genetic therapies because the stem cells themselves have a homing mechanism and tend to home to areas of injury, and also to deliver chemotherapeutic agents. This concludes the session about stem cell biology. In the next section, we will analyze good manufacturing practices.